Welcome to the Halloween edition of the Indie Film Hustle podcast, episode number 19. There is beauty in the grotesque, and cows are evil. Guillermo del Toro. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, guys, to a Halloween edition of the Indie Film Hustle podcast. I am your spooky host, Alex Ferrari. Don't forget to head on over to freefilmbook.com. That's freefilmbook.com to get your free download of any audiobook of over 40,000 audiobooks. So head on over, freefilmbook.com. So this episode's a really um, a fun episode. I wanted to bring in uh, Edwin Pagan from latinhorror.com. We really, uh, Eddie and I have known each other for a long time and wanted to uh, have him come over. I thought it would be a perfect Halloween edition of the show. And we uh, we started just jamming on everything that's horror, uh, the state of horror film, obviously Latin horror genre, as well as a ton of other very cool stuff. So I want you guys to take a quick listen to uh, to the intro to his uh, website. If you're a fan of horror and the macabre, visit the website that's scaring up a revolution in the genre of horror and helping establish a new one, latinhorror.com, the first English language website dedicated to Latin horror, featuring the leading dark creative expressionists from seasoned masters, to up-and-coming Latin horror files whose work is grounded in horror, the macabre, and gothic arts. Trailers, in-depth reviews and profiles, plus advanced screenings and exclusive giveaways. Latin horror, the destination for horror files everywhere. LatinHorror.com. Register today, because there will be sangre. That was like so awesome. I just had to put it in the podcast. Uh, Eddie's awesome, man. And we, like I said, we talk about his perspective as a cinematographer working with indie filmmakers over the years, uh, tips on cinematography, tips for indie filmmakers, uh, how to make a horror movie, what's a good horror movie, all sorts of cool stuff. So sit back. Uh, if you're alone in the dark, be careful because this might be a little scary for you. So enjoy the interview with Eddie Bagan of LatinHorror.com. Edwin, thank you so much for joining us on this Halloween edition of Indie Film Hustle podcast. Thanks for having me on, man. It's a pleasure after you know knowing you for so long and seeing you do this uh, this new initiative, which is fantastic. I like what you're doing with it, brother. I appreciate that, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, we met. Oh God, this is what 2004. 2005 yeah. something like that 2004 yeah something like that we met yeah around the time uh, uh broken was around and then we met at nalip if i'm not mistaken yes, the yeah. national uh, the national association of latin independent producers uh yeah. so yeah we worked on a bunch of uh projects then uh but yeah it's uh that's another thing man a lot of people don't realize relationships you know like you you meet people and you create these relationships over years and they do they're, they're very valuable in the future without without question Oh, absolutely. And in fact, you know, we talk about your, your, what you're doing. And one of the ones I listened to the other night was a, precisely about that. You were talking about how filmmakers need to really build relationships and not just think that because they're on social media, they have a direct link to people's, uh, you know, uh, attention. Right. And I think that's something that's happened with people like you and I who, you know, know each other for quite a while, aren't in contact all the time, mm -hmm. but can say, let's let's roll on this and it gets done because we know what's there. There's, a, there's an undercurrent of, of history, et cetera, that you know, we know. Exactly. It's like if, you know, if I, if I called you up, I'm like, hey, man, I want to do something with Latin horror, you know, and because we have that relationship, you'd be mm -hmm. like, yeah. And like you, you know, when we, when, we, when we decided to do this podcast, you just called me up. It's like, hey, let's, yeah, let's do it. As yeah. opposed to just being a cold call. Right and just like not knowing you, but that relationship. I mean, we're talking what ten years now. Yeah, yeah, I you know, know, I know. Yeah, no. If you were to call me, I know what I'm getting. So it's like you know, I know, I know. You know, the curatorial process is is so becomes secondary because I know what I'm getting already. Exactly, exactly. I, and uh, that that's that's something that a lot of filmmakers don't get. I get constantly bombarded with. Uh, now, uh, since Indie Film Hustle is growing uh, at such a rapid pace, I'm starting to get. You know, people just sending over scripts. Right. <laughs> They're like, "Hey, can can I? You know, I, I, where can I get money?" I'm like, "I, I who are you? Like, right. I don't. I, what's your name? Hi, how are you? <laughs> you know, like, you know." And I had another guy the other day contact me on Facebook, 
and he was so sweet and so nice about everything. And then we started a conversation, and then right. I, and yeah. I, and then right. I, and then I started to build a relationship with him a little bit. And but he he took interest in what I was doing, and he it was just it's just basic like manners almost. You know what right. I mean? Well, you know that's the problem with social media. It's become that's all eliminated. You know, people people want to say what they want to say and make it gospel, and then they want to cut to the chase when it's their turn to do something. And there is no manners. You know, there is no. No protocol. And, you know, and, and with, as you know, we both know, um, this business takes up so much of our time that you got to have protocol because you got to wedge in there at the right time mm -hmm. and, and not become a nuisance or else, you know, your emails get blocked. Your emails get blocked and you never get seen, which is what that podcast that, uh, that was podcast. Oh God, I don't even remember the number of it, but it's the, the, are you an indie filmmaker, uh, spammer. Right. Uh, I enjoyed that one a lot. Yeah. It, because I, I thought it was something that we should, so someone should say. <laughs> so anyway, we went off topic or we haven't even started our interview yet. Uh, so, um, I wanted to, uh, I want to ask you, can you tell uh, everybody a little bit about why you started latinhorror.com? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, as, 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 as you and I both know and, and other filmmakers that are listening to this, you know, you work on these big projects sometimes and I work a lot as a producer and a cinematographer. And what happens is, you know, you come off these projects and all of a sudden you're, you're, you're crushing through a sugar rush because you feel like right now there's nothing else on your plate, you know, mm -hmm. and you're theming for something. And I remember one time, this was in the, in the beginning of 2008, I was kind of looking for something to keep me occupied uh, innately with my skills and, and interests uh, that would do that between projects. And I knew that writing would probably be part of it. And, um, you know, I'm a big horror fan and I'm Latino. And one day when I was thinking about that, it just struck me. Those three words kind of floated around my head for a minute. And I was like, oh, Latin horror. Um, but, you know, it, it, I didn't think it would be out there. I would think that that it, there wouldn't be interest so much. I, I knew I was interested. Mm -hmm. um, but I said, no, it can't be that easy. This must already have been grabbed up, the idea, you know, the website, all of it. And when I started looking around, no, there was no website with that name. There were no magazines with that name. There were nobody, there was no one really talking about it in that regard. I mean, if they were talking about Mexican horror or Spanish horror, et cetera, yes, because it was it's in a nationalistic uh, keyframe. Mm -hmm. But as a whole, you know, as, as us talking about us as a distinct genre, nobody was talking about that. And I only came across a couple of uh, DVDs as an anthology with three, like, B-grade movies out of Mexico that were being sold, sold online. And they were packaged as Latin horror because when you bring it over, you can't say Hispanic or Mexican horror that much. You have to say, you know, Latinos. This is mm -hmm. Latinos. So they said Latin horror. But it was more as a, as a title than than a brand or a genre. Mm -hmm. And I started working, working on the website throughout that year and launched it on Halloween of Great. 2008. Um, a friend of mine wanted to put up as part of the website a place where people could register, and I allowed him to do that. And I hadn't checked back on it in a couple of months. When I came back, I had around 3,000 people that had registered. Oh, wow. And that blew my mind because it was like, oh, th there was a big interest for this. But, you know, the, you know, it was an even split between Latinos and non-Latinos because horror fans are avid. Yeah. You know, if you hear anything horror, you're going to it. And they were like, you know, what's this thing? He's talking about Latin horror. And at the time, I was using a moniker that was uh, first came rock in Espanol. Now we have Latin horror. Mm -hmm. uh, because they went through the same when they, you know Roqueros were doing uh, rock in Espanol people were like what's that even though the name kind of told you what it was right. now you don't have that issue you know rock in Espanol is, is what it is mm -hmm. and I think the same over the last uh, you know set of years almost like seven eight years people have uh, come on board with the concept as well I have people about 20 or 30 DVDs that I get a year where people have self-proclaimed the genre they're working in as Latin horror. Oh, cool. You know, it's not so far-fetched for people to say that and, and click with it anymore. You know, and it's expanding. So, you know, I, I, I can't claim to have created the genre. You know, people working in it, they just hadn't sort of consolidated into a, a brand or, or genre. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like saying with, we're taking ownership uh, of it under this uh, umbrella. That I can claim, but you know, it's 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 really is to make sure that it just moved forward and that that we're all working together and can you know take ownership of our own genre, the same as you know Japanese horror or Italian Korean horror, horror. Giallo, yeah. Korean horror, right? Sure, you know, and so now little by little, we're also fleshing out what that is, you know, because 
when you first come up with a concept, you still, you know, have to really historically carve it out and what does it mean in a trajectory over time. And, you know, those have come before and created work that fits and sort of, you know, create the brand in a way that makes sense for everyone, not just because you had an idea. Now, uh, I have a question for you. Now, I am. I'm a, I, I love I love good horror. You know, I'm mm-hmm. not a, I'm not a huge like I don't like blood and guts. You know, right. I enjoy the old slasher flicks from the '80s. You know, those are fun, but mm-hmm. I'm not. You know, it's not something I, I actually go after. So I'm not familiar with a lot of Latin horror, to be honest with you, other than obviously Guillermo uh, del Toro, which is he's probably the 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 leader of the of the movement, right? Um, and what he does, but. It, and I think this is a this is a broader question in regards to Latin culture in general. But right. I know Mexican. I know Mexican horror. I've heard of Mexican horror. Is mm-hmm. there Nicaraguan horror? Is there Colombian horror? Is there Argentinian there, horror? There are spurts of it. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest um, uh, South American, Central American countries that sort of on the cusp, on the leading cusp of it is Argentina right now. Mm-hmm. Um, you they know, have great filmmakers. A lot of, they great have filmmakers. great, and you know, great one of the things that's interesting is that in in this past year, uh, the country proper, you know, the government actually mm-hmm. started trying to revive their film industry, and that came as a direct result of the Argentinian filmmakers that are working in genre there, but specifically horror, who were getting a lot of tension outside the country, and the country looked at, at itself and said, you know, we really have to push this. And, you know, it's interesting that the genre of horror itself was the one that's kind of reactivated the industry there. You know, Mexican horror, as you said, you know, they've been doing it forever. They're really good at it. Um, Spain is at the leading end of a lot of horror Mm -hmm. films. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, what really what we're talking about is that the difference is, and I think Guillermo del Toro uh, summed it up best uh, quite a few years ago when he said, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said that American horror attempts to destroy the physical, the body, right? We talked about that with mm-hmm. the slasher, mm-hmm. porn, and all of that, which, you know, it can be fun sometimes, right? You want to see how the best new gimmick to, to, to destroy to, a human to, being, yeah, right? right? And that can be fun, but it gets old after a, a few films and it's the same gimmick. Right. And But Latin horror on the other spectrum is about destroying the mind and the soul, right? So it really goes back to the suspense, the supernatural, what's lurking in the shadows. You know, there's all these characters from Latino folklore, like El Cuco, La Llorona, yeah. you know, the Weeping Woman, sure, of course. et cetera. And one of the things that makes that particularly terrifying, like in the case of El Cuco, for instance, is that when your parents tell you, you have to go to bed or you have to finish your homework <laughs> um, or else El Cuco is going to get you, the fact remains that they never explain exactly what El Cuco is. Can you tell so me? I, I've, I, I actually, I've actually never heard of El Cuco. I've heard of really? Yalorona. I've never heard of I'm, I'm Cuban. Okay. So I have not, right, heard, right. I've not heard of El Cuco. I've heard so of Yalorona. 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 I've heard of ton, but never right. heard of El Cuco. Weeping woman. Yeah. Um, so what's El Cuco? Both- El Cuco, it, it, but that's the interesting thing about El Cuco. It's a lot in, in Mexico and Puerto Rico, and it's 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 not described in any fashion. It's just some ethereal being that if you don't behave is going to come in the middle of the night. The boogeyman. And, and the boogeyman. Boogeyman. To some it. degree. Mm-hmm. You know, the crack and whatever. But, mm-hmm. but El Cuco, there's no description of what it is. And because of that, your mind fills in the blank. If you're like an eight-year-old child in a room and your mother tells you, you better go to bed or El Cuco is going to get you, That's you're done. ducking under done. those sheets <laughs> and your mind is filling in what El Cuco is because right. it's never described. Right. And I think that you know that goes to our idiosyncratic uh, literature traditions of sort of Latin America, Spain, Mexico, uh, South and Central America, where we have a long – tradition of the of storytelling and a lot of it is gothic a lot of it has to do with our our religious faith you know beliefs and and we fill in those blanks and so to us going to see a horror movie and as you said a good horror movie you're making the distinction between the stuff that has all plot and then this happens and then that happens and there's bodies falling heads are coming off mm-hmm. versus latin horror which is a lot grounded in story in, in in character mythology right? right and mythology and our idiosyncratic traditions of storytelling and that's a big thing that's making a difference where a lot of people are gravitating to it because you know even in american you know culture uh, are coming on board because they're looking at it the way they looked at their horror in the 40s 50s and 60s where it was more about that mm-hmm. you know 
And I think uh, people are sort of like thirsty for that again. And so you're starting to little by little see the dial turn back the other way, um, where a lot of these movies that are coming out and are you know, so-called slasher porn um, are, are not doing so well at the box office because people, you know, people at the end of the day are intelligent. They want their, they want their, uh, their buttons pushed in a way that, that, you know, that pulls that adrenaline out and sort of takes them to another level. And even though the slasher films do that, and I'm a fan of them too, to some degree, it isn't the same as when you, you know, you're, you're sort of manipulated like a puppet on a string by a master, like someone like Guillermo and others who really know how to do that in a way that it isn't just a, a cat jumping out of the, the cupboard, you know, right. It's, it really holds you, you know, you have white knuckles on the theater seat versus, you know, just whiplashing back because, you know, something jumped out all of a sudden and that happens, you know, and there's blood in Latin horror mm. to some degree, but it isn't, it isn't about that. Well, yeah, the story like, and character is still always king and queen. Right. So like when you, I was watching an interview with uh, Guillermo the other day in regards mm-hmm. to his, um, to Pan's Labyrinth. Right. And like, and you start, and I start thinking back, you think of, I, when I thought of Guillermo, I'm like, oh yeah, he's a, you know, he's that horror guy. <clears throat> I mean, obviously he's done many other things, but you know, he's before he's like, oh yeah, he's the horror guy. He did this. But then you start thinking back, like his films are not violent or bloody in that sense. Not at all. They're not. They're very psychological. Um, exactly. And there was a great, uh, great line that he said, uh, which was awesome. That somebody told him when he did Pan's Labyrinth that he goes, "It's a really good movie. Maybe you should bring down the violence a bit, so mm. it can reach a broader audience." Mm-hmm. And Guillermo goes, "I don't care about a broader audience. I want its audience to right. enjoy it. You know, there's people exactly. who love it and people who will hate it, but it's that's why I wanted to make my movie, um, which is." such a great statement to say as a filmmaker <laughs> like and, and you see that even as in his his lifestyle as a, as a working artist where he'll do a big blockbuster like Pacific Rim and sure. then he'll go back and do something like he's doing now with Crimson with Crimson Peak yeah which is and there's not really anybody else that could do something like that on a studio level at this point no, like there's no. just there's nobody else that the studio would give and it was a, it's a low budget too right Crimson Peak's not it's relatively you know I think where you're seeing um the bigger scale of the budget is almost in the promotion of it, but I think that as as blockbusters go, this is this he's, is not a ten pole film, no. but it has that production value because he's such a a genius when it comes to production design and sort mm-hmm. of building out the world of his films that you know they 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 are ten times lusher than the than the fiscal allotment is going to you know show, and, and yet the, he he pulls it out. And then he just said also that his budget for visual effects on the entire movie is like three, four million bucks, which yeah. is insane for yeah. a scope of a film like that. But then you exactly. start, but he knows how to do it. He like he learned a lot in pans. Like he did right. all of that for like two million, two to three. Well, well, there's uh, there's uh, one thing that a lot of people don't know is that actually when Guillermo del Toro started, he started out mm-hmm. doing makeup effects, special effects, practical sure. effects, mm-hmm. and effects. So he knows that world inside out. That's where he started before he started directing. So you know he's one of those people who's a natural born illustrator mm-hmm. and artist and visual artist, and so you know. To him, that goes hand in hand. There is no this, you know, no separating Guillermo from the visual artist. So, you know, well, you know, he gets kudos for being this amazing director, mm-hmm. but he's he's a uh, he's a, a born natural visual artist, and you know, the gothic and the the macabre is his his wellspring. And so, mm-hmm. when you put those two things together, ain't nobody pulling it out of the hat like he can. No, no, no. He is very unique voice and. In- in the world today, especially as a filmmaker, no question. Mm-hmm. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you love horror films so much? You know, that's an interesting question. Um, I, 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 I still to this day can't answer that. I mean, I love I love what how they make me feel. I like the suspense that's, um, that's born out of it. You know, whenever mm-hmm. I go to a dark theater and I'm sharing this experience with three, four hundred other people. But the genesis of it began actually when I was a, a, a kid. My my sister at the time, my sister's a lot older than me. She's about 18 years older than me. So I was about, I don't know, seven, eight, nine at the most. And my sister would, you know, at the time she was go, she was dating the, the gentleman that ultimately would be, become a husband and father of her children. And my mother, on the other hand, wasn't having it. And she would have <laughs> me go along on these dates, you know? <laughs> right. And I guess they liked horror, you know, or it was wow. her, 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 uh, her fiance's, um, 
knack of taking her there because he knew she would have to wrap her arms around. Of course, around. of course. And they would always take me along, you know. And the first movie we ever saw together was Tales of the Crypt, the original British uh, production. Oh, wow. Um, and then the next movie that we saw together was The Exorcist. Oof. You know? <laughs> and, yeah, I know. <laughs> top heavy stuff that I don't think I should have even been seen at that age. But there was something about it, the fear and the thought that remained with me all, you know, like weeks afterwards. Mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't a fear like I was cringing on the covers. It was like, I want more. You know, mm -hmm. it was almost like I became addicted to it to some degree, you know? And um, then, you know, as I was able to go to, to the theater on my own with my friends, et cetera, we would always gravitate. And then again, I, was, I, I, was, I came of age uh, as, a, as, a, as a teenager, et cetera, in the 80s. So, Oof, you know, this is, yeah. you know, Halloween and all these fantastic, The Thing, which is one of my favorite movies. Um, you know, I grew up in that time where all these movies were out and they did have a little bit of the gore. They did have a lot of, you know, yeah, the, the Freddies body, and the Jasons, the bodies, sure. Uh, hitting the floor but they were also character driven and you know we're talking a lot about the visual effects with practical effects which always seems to sell a movie more than just 100 percent digital and um you know i just I, I don't know i think i was lucky in that sense that i grew i was i was uh, exposed to it at the right age became hooked to it and you know grew up in an age where horror was the the flavor of the month people were really into their horror films at that time i remember um, i remember yeah. Yeah, i mean freddy I mean, I mean they used to sell freddy like action figures exactly <laughs> i mean to kids it was like it was yeah. the 80s where you can sell an r rated movie movie yeah, merchandise was, yeah. there was like, like i think the robocop <laughs> Yeah, yeah, the RoboCop toys. Nobody, you know, your parents said, "Okay, you're gonna go to movies. That's all they, you know. He's gonna be somewhere safe." Exactly. You yeah, know, exactly. they weren't like too too keen on 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 vetting the content. Oof. And uh, can you, know, you imagine for being better a or kid? worse? I think you know it had a pronounced impact on me, and I think that was the genesis. But you know, got hooked and have been a horror lover and patron ever since. Now, what uh, what makes a good horror movie? Well. I think we go back to the basis of El Cuco. I think a, a good horror movie is the movie that sort of keeps you in suspense until the payoff, right? Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and again, if we go to the distinction between um, American horror movies and Latin horror movies or non-Latino non horror movies, not just to keep picking on the American horror movies, mm -hmm. part of what happens is that, you know, from frame one in the non-Latino horror movie, uh, people are dropping Heads are coming off. People are vanishing. And we don't kind of take it, you know, yeah, we're a little spooked, but there's no, we got to get out of here. There's no, something really terrible is going on here. And we're sort of negating it, you know, like 50% to 90% that anything really horrible is taking place. That's why people keep dropping, right? It's like they keep falling into the mousetrap, even though there's already a mouse, uh, you know, kind of cut in half there. And, and in, in, a, in a Latino horror movie, from frame one, we believe that there's something going on, that there's a spirit, that there's a demon, that there's an entity, that there's some sort of otherworldly phenomenon going on. And so we, we, that's it. That's done. That's a done deal. We take it for granted because of our religious beliefs, et cetera. And then we go forward wanting to know why it's happening. How can I get rid of it? How can I, you know, get back to normal? Um, and, and one of the things that you'll see in a lot of horror movies that a lot of it is it's unresolved sort of otherworldly tension. For instance, you know, somebody died in the house in a very horrific way and now their spirit is in limbo until mm -hmm. someone can find out who it was that killed them and sort of bring around closure on that, right? Mm -hmm. And again, it's story-based. So there's this whole sequence playing out throughout the movie where we're interacting with this thing and not just trying to avoid it, even though it's it's definitely interacting with us. Now, what would um, and, and you might have the answer to this? Is just mm -hmm. a, a, where was the origins of horror? Like, what's the oldest horror story? I mean, I'm thinking I'm going back to like you know uh, the Christmas Carol with the ghosts, but like where, where's the some of the first genesis? Like, did the Greeks talk about? You know, well, the, the Greeks, the the Greeks definitely talked about tragedy. Uh, you know, the foibles of men, et cetera. Sure. And there, and and it and it and it and it and there's a lot of uh, darkness in those. But I think a lot of it came from Europe. You know, when the plagues the were going on, right? Even before that, we're talking about the Middle Ages, where you know. Uh, the Gothic era was in full play. We're not sure. talking about Gothic in the sense of England 
in the 1700s, 1800s, no, when they, they were now writing about it. But, you know, it goes way back where even... 1200s, 1300s. 1300s, where you, you certainly see uh, these things playing out in a, in a very real way where people were taking it as gospel to some degree that what was making these things happen were not natural, but, you know, right. from the, another, another world, from some, someone was causing this to happen. And then you come into the, you know, the, the, the 16, 1700, 1800s, where you have even nursery rhymes based on these plagues. Like, I know. You know they're just cute. And then you bring look, around you the rosy. The word, exactly. <laughs> you listen to the words you talk about. We're talking about the black plague. Why are we... <laughs> <laughs> we singing this to my four year old. I know. I was just like, I was singing it because I have, I have uh, twin daughters now. They're almost four, and and then they were singing "Ring Around the Rosy," pocket exactly. full of poetry. And I'm like, and then we all fall down. I'm like, that that's yeah. about the freaking plague. That's about the plague. <laughs> but I think that I think that the, what's colored a lot of modern, you know, movies, horror movies, has been definitely the Gothic period in in England, where they were masters of sort of that that storytelling technique. You know when. Uh, Frankenstein was written, you know, uh, these Dracula, kind of, sure. Dracula. And um and also, you know, the the Grimm the, the, the Germany, the Grimm's fairy tales, etc. But then you have it sort of like then colored by the by the palette of German expressionism and, and sort mm -hmm. of that that look which if you if you sort of look at the 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 directors of the twenties and thirties that came here and started even working in, in in Hollywood. Most of them were like from Germany, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And and they brought over into those horror films that that palette of of German expressionism, which kind of is like a, a precursor to film noir, et cetera. But you know that that if you look at uh, any horror film, where even if it's in color, we're still using that sort of uh, that palette of of darks and shadows, chiaroscuro for for lack of a better word. Where we're we're doing that, you know, and I've had incidents on a film set as a cinematographer where I kick over a light by mistake, or or someone does, mm -hmm. and it hits the floor. If it doesn't, if the bulb doesn't burst, I look at him like, "Oh, that's perfect. Leave it there. It looks fantastic." You know, it created some new shadows we, <laughs> hadn't, even, we hadn't even seen. Or you right. turn off a light by mistake, and you say, "Oh, that's better. It was overlit before. This is much better." You know, right? And so you have this whole this whole psyche coming out of out of those periods that still what's kind of coloring. Uh, cinema today, the best cinema. That's actually if Crimson Peak. That's where you can see uh, Guillermo del Toro flourishing the best because he's going back to these romantic Gothic novels as an inspiration for the work he's doing now, and that's he lives there. Right. Yeah, and I've seen that. I've seen that video of his uh, Bleak House. Exactly. Which is just insane. His his house of, I, I mean, it's like a, it's a playground. It's uh, it's so beautiful. Uh, like the mm. the man has built his. The ultimate man cave. <laughs> I know. I mean, I would, I would kill to have something like that. And you know, I, I, I you know, I, I think I was just telling my girlfriend last night. I said I'd settle, I'd settle for the man room instead of like you know yeah. that mansion he has. Right. And it's interesting because I was at the New York Times building just last night, and uh, they were for a Times talk, and Guillermo del Toro uh, was the person who was supposed to uh, be the featured guest, and mm -hmm. then they announced just before we went in that. He had uh, gotten ill and wasn't going to be able to to attend, you know. So it's kind of a bummer. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, uh, the man is all over the place these oh, days. Oh God, he's man, is he ever? And, and and but he loves it, you know, because he's he's not only promoting himself, but he's also, uh, you know, he has that Midas touch that when he finds young talent, uh, their work gets greenlit, and 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 he's moving it forward. And you see his distinctive style, even though he's not the one directing. A particular film that he produces or comes on as executive producer, you see his his uh, thumbnail, a thumbnail print, all mm -hmm. over it, you know, and um, he's remarkable in that sense, you know. And hopefully, I mean, it just keeps opening up doors for other people working in genre that are respectable to the craft to continue to blossom, and and you know we can get more intelligent horror films out there. Exactly. Now, with that said, what do you feel? How do you feel about all of these? found footage, paranormal activity style horror films? You know, I, I'm not into it. I got to say, you know, I've seen one or two that have captivated me for an hour or two. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I remember uh, years ago, I went to see the, the one that started a lot Blair. of this. Blair Witch. Sure. At the, here in New York at the Anthology Film Archives, because I think that the filmmakers originated here in New York, and mm -hmm. I think they did one of the early screenings here in New York. And I went to see it, and, you know, I mean, I had, 
gotten caught up with the mythology. Oh, no, it was brilliantly it was marketed. Brilliant. Oh, my God, brilliantly uh, and marketed. And you couldn't tell what was real and not. And then uh. I went to see the movie, and I think 45 minutes in, I actually left. Oh, and really? If it, and if, and, yeah, and if it hadn't been, I saw it later on because uh -huh. I wanted to really see what really happened. But uh -huh. I remember leaving, sneaking out. Um, and then, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that it was a free screening, I probably would have went to the box office and demanded my money back. Right. And that's not and that's not to put the movie down. It's just that that particular, you know, we all have a taste for things. Some are acquired, some are just naturally mm -hmm, part mm -hmm. of what we desire. And I never really sort of bought into the that particular style subgenre of horror. And, you know, I don't know. For me, it just doesn't do it for me, you know, with the whole shaky cam, which I've seen done very well in other films like Rec, mm -hmm. a Spanish film, uh, you know. But for the most part, I don't know. I, I haven't yet to seen something that's blown me away uh, in that genre. So, you know, I mean, others would have a different take on it. But, you know, all I can be, all I can answer that from is my, from Wait, my personal, personal experience. point of view. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, when I saw Blair Witch, too, I saw it. Uh, I did. I don't. I don't even remember if I knew what was going on. The only thing I did, I, I thought that was missing in Blair Witch is at the very end, mm -hmm. when the when the camera falls on the ground. Right. I just wanted to see a pair of floating feet. Yes. Yeah, that's all. That, that's all I needed. Yeah. I get chills even thinking about it. If but I would have just seen the those clips. guys, those guys have done well and they oh, continue to God. work. They yeah, Edward. Work. Edward. Um, Edward. Edward Sanchez is his name. The, yeah, the direct one of the co-directors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's working. Yeah. He's working now on um, from Dust Till Dawn the series. Yeah. Um, so you know. Yeah, they, you know everybody starts. You got to think about this as like the formative work, right? So. Oh God, no! Uh, but it was look. So, I, I I will never take anything away from. It. I think they have the one of the most brilliant marketing campaigns in the last thirty years. Honestly, absolutely. Yeah. And they started a genre. Pretty much. You know, they pretty you can't much take that away from them. I'm just saying that you know personally on my end, found footage films are not my my cup of tea. But other than that, right. you know, it's not a. It's it's just about taste sometimes. Now, what's your favorite subgenre of horror? That there are many different subgenres of horror. What's your favorite kind of horror? Well, I'm I'm still taking you know I'm still finding that people are doing really interesting things with the zombie genre, <laughs> which is very um, hot, obviously. Which now. is very hot, but I think that it's also it just it's a good thing to play with because I think that you know I mean what what more horrible oh. an idea than <laughs> anyone you know can all of a sudden turn against you and uh, eat you. Kill you and eat and you and eat you and eat you, <laughs> it's and a eat pretty, you it's, alive alive it's not like they're gonna like tranquilize you first no, they no, eat no. you alive right so you're you're being consumed and going through that pain so i think that you know i've become a big zombie fan and um, there's a lot of shows obviously that the walking have dead made it right, big sure. walking dead uh, you know, the the lead up after that, et cetera. But uh, I think that still people are exploring it in interesting ways. And you know what's interesting? Here's a little trivia for people that may not know. Um, the godfather, I should say the grandfather of the zombie genre is Latino. Of course. George Romero. Exactly. George Romero, Cuban-American from the Bronx. Right? I didn't know he was Cuban. George He's Cuban-American, bro. Wow. He's a paisano. He's a Mi gente. Paisano. <laughs> He's a paisano, so a cubano. Wow, I didn't know it was from Cuban. the South Bronx. Right, uh, created the the, the, genre. the zombie genre as we know it. That's mm -hmm. not to say that zombies didn't exist before that, because you know there are films that they appear in in some form, and particularly with films out of like you know that cover supposedly uh, show Haiti with the voodoo, etc. Sure, where they have sure. these, like these sort of. Uh, walking slaves, you know, where mm -hmm, chemicals mm -hmm. are thrown in their face and concoctions, and all mm -hmm. of a sudden they're they're at the beck and call of their master. So, but in terms of what we know the zombie as, what it's kind of evolved to, he's he created that in yeah. Night Night of the Living Dead, right? You know, so. And then and Maestro de los Zombies is un Latino. I know, right? It's uh, yeah, a lot of people don't know that. You're right. A lot of people don't understand that the zombies started but with George in that in yeah. that black and white movie, which which fell into public domain. And I don't understand. Yes. I I really one day would love to know why that happened. Yeah, I, I well, I know that it was a mistake that the producers did at one point. Obviously, and, <laughs> yeah, and it went into that the exact things. He never really talks about it too much. He just cracks up about how they messed up big time. Yeah, and he uses more expletive words because he's like that when he's being into it. He just like you know he just throws it out there. All right. But um, you know it's funny because I think um, there's uh, Latin horror on on Saturday October twenty uh, fourth here in New York City. 
uh, is doing uh, an event where Bobby Sonabria, who's a very well-known uh, band leader musician, um, is going to be. We're going to be showing the film with the uh, the Bronx Music Heritage Center mm-hmm. uh, as a public event where we're going to be showing the movie mm-hmm. Night of the Living Dead in Black and White. Um, with Bobby and his bandmates actually doing the score to the movie like they did in the oh. Silent Days film. So that's going to be a nice little event. Oh, it'll be so much fun. Yeah, you know, so that kind of stuff, you know. So obviously, you know, if, if it was in public uh, domain, we probably couldn't pull that one off. Right. Um, but, you know, it's, it, you know, it's sad, though. But, you know, like he says, he said in interviews before, uh, you know, the world is better for it to some degree, even though if his bank account isn't. Right, because everyone now gets to see it, and it'll probably get farther distributed, if you will. Yeah, and then uh, look what it's caused with the fact that, you know, it wasn't a patented idea. No, it wasn't. An, exactly. All it, this it, other horror stuff probably wouldn't have gotten to the level if they would have had the reins on it. I can, and, and like movies like, um, oh, what's it? It's not, is it Dawn of the Dead? It's the one in the, the mall. Dawn of the Dead. Yeah, that was like, you, you look at his, it was George that did that one, right? Yes, he did. Yeah, that that movie, all the and the thirty others of the dead. Yeah, exactly. But that specific one, I remember uh, watching something talking about uh, the basically social commentary he was making. Oh, exactly. It wasn't just about a bunch of zombies. It was about exactly about you know. So you could start looking deeper and you know into it than just you know. Of course, there was some blood and guts in it, but if you look at it, he was making social commentary about the times and things like that, which was what good art should do, regardless right. and, of genre. And, you know, and, and it's interesting because film scholars and, and you know, people that deconstruct images, exact, particularly in film, uh, have noted many times that um, more than any other genre, um, horror does kind of become a frame of the times. If you look at many of the horror films, you'll see that they're sort of echoing a lot of the concerns and, you know, and passions of the time in a different way. So, so it's known for sort of kind of becoming a, a sort of a time capsule for the period in which the film was done. So then why is it now that apocalyptic zombie movies have become, and zombie genre has become so popular in today's world? That's a good question. Well, I think, I think, uh, and I read an article recently about that. I forget uh, who wrote it, but, you know, they were making the the comparison with, you know, everything that's happening now with terrorism Mm -hmm. and how all these borders are being erased. And whereas at one point uh, your enemy was was you know you were able to point out your enemy because you were both uh, wearing uniforms. Right, black, and, one was wearing the black hat, one was wearing the white hat. Right, exactly. <laughs> and now that's been erased, and so uh, you know a person down the street could be somebody looking out to uh, to you know to destroy you or attack you, and vice versa because you know we we do it overseas as well. And so you know I think that's the genesis for sort of the what's happening now with all of this stuff that it could come from anywhere, viruses and things of that nature. Economic uh, hits. Economic, you know, all that. There's a ton global, of this. You know, the, the, the whole global economy and how all this sort of blurring of borders is now creating all these other, you know, blowback effects. Very, it sounds very true. Uh, now, let me ask you, do you think it's tougher today to scare an audience member than it was 20 years ago? I think so. I think we're very jaded. You know, I myself find going, I go to a good horror film or, you know, what I think is going to be a good horror film because, you know, you can be deceived by the trailers and all the publicity and sometimes mm-hmm. the film looks much better, uh, you know, in, in short runs, uh, like a teaser or a trailer or posters and, you know, and, and you go see the film and I'm sitting there practically laughing at how corny the execution of it is or how bad the story is. Right. And so I think, I think you know, and, and I think but that that's true of modern audiences uh, across the board, I think we're, you know, MTV educated us to be more sophisticated of how much information we can take in in a minute with the fast cutting and this and mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. Uh, you know, just the, the the linear time kind of consumption of, of images. And, 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 and we're more into intelligent, you know, I mean, a lot of the stuff that, that we were afraid of in the 50s, 40s, and even before that, even in our Latin American literature, now we look at it and we're like, oh, that's an old wives tale. And so for someone to really, you know, come out and really pull the strings uh, in a way that really makes our adrenaline sort of bubble up and, 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 you know, and our psyche get engaged in that way in that dark space, it takes a lot more effort. And I think that's one of the reasons they're going back to old fashioned storytelling, like the gothic novels, the uh, suspense, the thriller. You know, instead of the slasher, you know, the slashers are good. It's a good, you know, it's good like a roller coaster ride. But if you really want to get scared, you go into the haunted house. Right. And, and the thing is, a slasher film, I think, in a lot of ways is a lot easier 
to make than a psychological thriller or something that gets you in in your bones or in your mind yeah, or in I, your soul. I would, I would have to agree with that to a certain degree because of that's course. not also you know I mean, it's not a blanket really statement. Good one, you know, the technique of having to make a lot of those um, those slasher films pay off takes some skill, Ooh, and then um, some. But I think when you have to really like finesse. Uh, the story, the acting, and let those things play out, uh, you know, as you shot it on set and then how it intercuts later when the editor and you are in, a, in there, you know, cutting the film. It, there's a lot of skill in that because, you know, how long do you hold a shot? How, mm -hmm. how much blood is how in much the shot? Do you reveal, what <laughs> right. you don't reveal. You yeah. know, and sometimes, you know, holding back some information till the right moment is all it takes, right? So it isn't about, oh, look at this, look at that, look at this. Sometimes it's just like, all right. You play with the audience. You hold a little bit of information that you know they're thinking about that they're going to sort of, you know, because everybody wants to figure it out. We go to horror film, any film these days, and from frame one, we swear we already know who the killer is, what's going to happen. And, it's so tough. You know, it's so tough it's being tough. a filmmaker and a storyteller yeah. nowadays. Exactly. So part of your job these days is how to, like, you know, how to become that ringleader that's making – you know, the lion jumped through the hoop and all of a sudden an elephant comes through and it's like, oh, what, what, what just happened? You know, and it's like, it's a, it's a tough genre, but it's, you know, I think it's a genre that, you know, every year they, 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 they uh, announce the death of the horror film and how oh, it's, you know, please. but, you know, It'll it's, it's the studios themselves because it's always they announce that that starts coming to the fore when their big tent film comes. And then on their low season, they're putting out these more low budget films that provide a bigger uh, you know, return on the investment. All of a sudden, horrors are back in. It's you know, it's crap. It's the game they play. So, film, film, films, horror films are not going anywhere anytime soon, or anytime in the long run. So, as long as we we are in, we have the capacity to still feel uh, fear mm -hmm. and and that sort of high end emotion of of of, of you know self preservation in in the face of fear. It's not going anywhere. No, agreed. And, and I was uh, I was just watching something on uh, Hitchcock the other day, mm -hmm. who's one of my favorite directors of all time. Oh yeah, um, and and the master of suspense, and he did exactly. a lot for for suspense thrillers, not as much horror, but suspense. Right. I mean, he was the guy. He was the master. Exactly. Uh, and how he shot uh, Psycho specifically in black and white because he didn't want to see any blood because he he can't stand blood. <laughs> he said he yeah. couldn't stand blood so he shot it in black and white and that you barely and you and during the infamous shower scene you never ever see the knife go in ever oh no no it's just a, it's, a yeah, it's up in the air it's coming down shot know, of the get, eye shot of this yeah. and it's, it's what, masterful it's why everyone Sequence. studies it it's why yeah. everyone studies it um so you're also not only a horror maven and fan uh but you're also a cinematographer so yeah. what made you want to jump uh, behind the camera as a cinematographer uh, as out of all the jobs that you could do in the film business? Well, I started there. Um, I, you know, in, in the South Bronx, when I was about 10 years old, my mother enrolled me in the, the boys clubs, so you know, the Madison Square Boys Club, Ho Avenue Clubhouse in the South Bronx. Uh, as a way to keep me sort of reined in, you know, this is the 80s and all this stuff is happening, you know. Actually, it was when I was 10, it was the 70s. And so, you know, a lot in is going Bronx. on in the South Bronx. Uh, oof, yeah. And so she, you know, she was raising me as a single single parent and she, we had just moved into the area and she found out about the boys club and enrolled me there. And, you know, I made friends very quickly there. Um, and one of the things I discovered early on after becoming a member at the age of 10 was that they had a dark room in the basement. Um, and um, there was a gentleman there who was the art director for the Boys Club, Ernesto Lanzano, who sort of became my, my teacher and mentor for about eight years while I was, you know, learning my craft. And it's ironic because I had only tripped into that as, as a bunch of my friends and I had gone into the wood shop right next door and uh, the pottery room to get some clay so we can go outside and pelt each other with clay, have a clay fight in the street. <laughs> And uh, but when I went by the dark room, which was outside of those other two rooms, I stopped at the door frame for a moment because it was you know this room is painted black. It was Ernesto was in there with two other students, and uh, I was by the door a little too long. And he said, "Well, you're either in or out because you're just during the class." And I left, of course, because I wanted to be with my friends. But I came back the next day, and he started telling me you know, when they met, what they could teach me, that it would be fun, that it would be creative. I had nothing to lose, and I started coming to the classes, and I was hooked. You know, I learned how to take photos, develop black and white film, make my own prints. This thing, fil this thing, film you speak of, what is that? 
oh, film. You know, it's this uh, <laughs> chemical process. Uh, it's, the, it's this salt, silver salts on an acetate that, you know, it gets exposed you're, to light. You're, you're then, speaking gibberish, sir. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> the fe- I, mean, I have fever. I have fever from last night. <laughs> you know, and I was hooked. I was hooked. The magic of it, of, of watching, uh, you know, a print. Uh, come to life after you 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 expose the paper and, and put it, it in the developer. It's, 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 oh a my magi- God. it's magical, really. Is. It's magical. And, you know, but by the time I was about 17 or 18, I was called into the director's office, Ralph Porter. I still remember him kindly. He's a great man. And and they asked me if I was interested in taking these two classes at School of Visual Arts that they had some vouchers for. One was in production, the other was in cinematography. So I went, you know, the the week of the, the first class and I was in producing. You know, at the time I'm 17, 18, you know, crunching numbers, creating schedules. I was like, this is not for me. And so I went back the next day. I said, well, I don't know about that producing class at the time. And he says, well, that's fine. We'll give this one to another student, another member of the boys club. But go tomorrow and check out the one on cinematography. And, of course, that fit like a glove, right? There was nothing they were doing there that was foreign to me or wasn't interesting, except now we're working with, with moving pictures. And over the years, I just, you know, little by little got into uh, cinematography proper and, and ending up on people's sets being kind of a, like a shadow. And little by little being given jobs, smaller jobs to do. Until, you know, eventually I was the, the cinematographer on, on projects, you know, both small and big. But in New York, mostly, you know, smaller budgeted films, all indie work. But it was a great proving ground. And, you know, Jesus Christ, it's what now? It's like, you know, 25, 30 years that I've been a cinematographer. And you've been and most, I, and most of that time you've been in New York? In New York. Mm -hmm. For sure. You know, so I've worked almost with everybody in New York who's done something. And the interesting thing is that, you know, I've directed as well and written as well. But the one thing that I would still do innately if I'm given the choice is cinematography. You know, I like directing, but, you know, there's always that that passion that you would do whether there was nothing else you could do. Mm -hmm. And I think photography and 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 uh, and cinematography are still the things that I gravitate to the most. You know, I'll. Now, can you tell me Love a little? Uh, can you tell me a little bit about the New York independent film scene? Because I'm I'm from LA and I'm from originally from Miami, as you know. Right. So I know the Miami film independent film scene, and I know the LA scene, but I don't know a lot about other than what I've read and stuff like that. Right. How is it on the street, like if you will, uh, of the indie film scene there? Well, you know, one of the things that happens in New York that I think doesn't happen uh, as much in other places is that, you know, people really come together and, and, you know, it's kind of a testing, proving ground, a good way to learn. And a lot of people work on a lot of people, they cross-pollinate projects. And so um, a lot of people go to film school here or just sort of get into the, the craft just by osmosis because, you know, they're around people that do it or are interested. And so you get a lot of people that sort of are working on small projects and um, and are looking for people to work with them. And, you know, a lot of people that are, have the skills when they're in between uh, other projects, sometimes even if they're seasoned uh, craftspeople, will work on a smaller project. Uh, smaller films because there's creativity on smaller projects that sometimes doesn't happen on bigger budgeted projects in terms of the fun that you can have and you know how loose it is um and so i got into you know when when i when i started really becoming a cinematographer i started sort of hanging out with other filmmakers that already had a little bit of a track record and i remember one time distinctively a friend of mine who i had said that i wanted to get back into filmmaking because i got also got into theater for a while Mm -hmm. and after a small period there where i wasn't doing any film a friend of mine, Sonia Gonzalez, who's a filmmaker herself, um, basically mentioned that a small group was forming in New York uh, called NALIT, the National Association of Latino mm-hmm. Independent Producers. And the organization itself uh, hadn't been around very long at that time. They were forming chapters. The national board was sort of evolving. And I started going to these meetings and, you know, there would be 25, 30, 40 people there. They were meeting at that time at WNET 13 uh, on West 30th Street. Um, and you know, it was like just so, I mean, you know, it's even hard to describe because there was a feeling about all these young people that were creative sort of getting together and showing their sample work or, you know, showing, uh, uh, an excerpt of something that they were, there was a work in development, et cetera, or even showing work that was already had been broadcast because you had some people coming in that Mm -hmm. had more experience. 
And, you know, over the years, that group grew. I mean, it, it's grown from what it was at that time, probably about three or four chapters to now, like, I think over 18 chapters across the country. You know, and mm -hmm. so it's a force to be reckoned with. But a lot of the people that at that time that I was part of it have gone on to do, you know, major work. Uh, you know, Alex Rivera, uh, Cristina Ibarra, Sonia Gonzalez, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just dozens of people who cut their teeth during that time just by interacting with each other and have gone on to do, you know, like, you know, serious work in TV, in film and documentary for the most part. And, but New York is like that. New York, you know, people want to get together and I've gone to LA and I've done projects in LA, both commercials and, 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 and narrative work. And if you're, if you hit the floor in LA on the West coast, uh, for a period of time, and you talk to people about your projects, they all say, oh, I'm in, I'm in. But when you're getting ready, you're getting closer. <laughs> it's yeah. all about what's the budget and what's right. the line item for me. And, you know, and I can respect that, right? Because I get pretty antsy when I get the, the, the script and it's all, you know, this is an old budget thing. But you got to have a little wiggle room, you know. And But, you know, but that's how L.A. is. L.A. is all business and it's that's what you go there. It's a town to, to create and work and and the work there is primarily business. That's how you earn your living. And I think in New York, a lot of people do other things as they're developing their craft and are willing to sort of roll their sleeves up with other filmmakers to get the experience too. So there's sort of a effervescence that bubbles up here in New York among uh, independent filmmakers that you probably don't see anywhere else. And, and, and another thing that happens in New York is that because of the the transportation hub, the infrastructure for people to get mm -hmm. around, you can say we're going to meet in an hour and you can have 25 people meet at that location because it doesn't take, it isn't that hard to kind of get there. Yeah, LA is not that West easy. Coast, <laughs> you know, if you want to have a meeting, even if it's a membership meeting and you have it in LA and people are coming out from the outer regions or the Hollywood Hills or, or whatnot, mm -hmm. you know, it's going to probably take them an hour, two hours or three hours in LA traffic, right? And so right. that's a turnoff. And it's a little harder to do it there. But New York, it's always been, uh, you know, and you have an active, an active film hub in New York. You know, the, the the television industry is popping in New York, always has. Yeah. There were pockets of time where, you know, it wasn't so much. But there's always activity in New York. You can't go out on a weekend or any weekday and walk anywhere in New York where you don't see some – uh, evidence of a film in production, whether it's small or large, you know, well, it's just it's just part and parcel. People don't even get taken aback anymore by seeing a film production. You know, they just want to get by. You know, <laughs> right? <laughs> That's a new, it's very New York. That's I don't know. I, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but I lived in New York for ten years when I was growing yeah. up. Yeah, I was. I grew up in Queens. Um, yeah. And the one thing I noticed, uh, and, and people always ask me about LA and New York, and like, what's the difference as far as the film industry is concerned? Mm -hmm. And what I always say is like. If New York, if film, if the film industry literally left New York tomorrow, New York is New York. Right. But if if the film industry left Los Angeles uh, today, it's gone. The, the city yeah. would the city would come crum crumbling down well, that's around. A, that's it. a that's a fantastic observation. I hadn't looked at it that way. That's very true. Yeah, I mean that's New York's true. New York. I mean New York yeah. has a million of other industries. While I mean, don't get me wrong, LA is a you know it's the third second biggest city in the country uh, and it's massive but it's based and built on a, in the film industry so if you right, took the, yeah. if, if you took the film industry out completely like go, it, the whole city would fall i think would fall yeah. apart it, it would dry up somewhat yeah new york well in new york i mean i think you're right because i think new york is new york and there has to there happens to be film, film activity <laughs> right here. exactly it, it, you know the city i mean they'll lose they'll lose some income you know, it's like london or, like like yeah. london uh, you, there, there's some film in london and there's yeah. a lot of film in london don't get me wrong but if all the film industry left london london will be london london will be london la is very distinctive that way yeah yeah so uh, after shooting so many indie films over the years what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen filmmakers make oh my god <laughs> It's going to be a long podcast. <laughs> no, 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 I'll keep it short. I, I, no, no, it's okay. But, it's but okay. I think, okay. you know, the, I think preparation, I think people take pre-production for granted. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's, I love pre-production. I love sitting down with the people that I'm going to work with in the mud later on and sort of toss out ideas. I mean, you have the script, you have the director's vision, but there's so much that, so much fun that could be had at that point. And I mean fun. You know, I think people look at it as chore and they think they just want to get to the nitty gritty and that's the fun. 
And, you know, being on set and shooting is fun. Mm-hmm. But but that pre-production, that time leading up to it where you get to, like, see source material or, or, or look through color palettes or say, you know, these are the costumes. Um, these are the things that we could do. How do we execute this shot? Well, let's look at things that have been done before. Let's try to come up with something uh, that's innate to your film, a signature shot that only – will be seen in your film and a reason for it. And I always talk to directors about that when I'm shooting for them. I'm saying, let's start thinking of a style or or shots that you want to execute that you think might be hard to do, but that are innate to the storyline. Not just a gimmick, because, you know, you can come up with nice shot, put it on a dolly and pull it off of a dolly and have the guy go in the rest of the way with a steady cam. And, like know. I Am Cuba style, right? Exactly. <laughs> but, but... You know, I'm talking about shots that are signature that, you know, if they weren't moving, they could be a poster. And and pre-production is amazing. And I think a lot of emerging uh, filmmakers, and sometimes even more seasoned pros, don't take the time to enjoy that process. Because, I mean, it's so much to, there's so much creativity that can happen there. And, and not just from you. And I always tell directors this that are emerging, too, when I'm on a panel or something. It's like, listen, be open. Don't worry about it because what happens is at the end of the day, any, 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 anything that happens on your film that's magic, they're not going to say it was the cinematographer. They're not going to say it was the writer. They're going <laughs> to say, wow, what an amazing shot so-and-so did who's the director, right? whether it's a man or a woman. And, and so, you know, that's, that's a point where in, in the process where you can really sort of absorb a lot of information that, you know, people are helping you to polish and, and, and you know, and tactics that you can employ and even ways to make it better. Because I think that, you know, there's the script and then there's things that the, the, the actors bring to it or other people that are talented that are part of the crew, uh, whether it's above or below the line, that can add something to it. So if you if you sort of like, you know, if you lock your way self away mentally and that it's only going to be your way or the highway, you're not going to be very effective as a director. And I think those are the ones that we normally read about in the trades where the battles happen and people are walking off set because it's like, you know, you know, unless you're in a tour where your, your, your vision is so razor sharp that unless it's done your way, people are not going to know that it's your work. There's a difference, but you've earned that, right? Right. Yeah, James, it, Cameron, yeah. James Cameron wasn't James Cameron when he did his very first movie. Exactly. <laughs> you know, neither even, was Michael even, Mann. And even Guillermo del Toro the, no. saw a short of his that was an early piece, which was okay. And that's probably as much as I can say. It was okay. Right. But, you know, now, look at him now. He's amazing. Right. You know? And so we you all have, to, have to start somewhere. And I've done short films that I'll never show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe if like some, some in, in some epoch I become, uh, you know, known and somebody wants to throw it on as, you know, look, look at back when. But yeah. not while I'm developing. I'm not, you know, it's not going to be seen. Of course. Of course. But, you know, we all get there. We all have to do it. Yeah, I was actually just, uh, I just did a, a post on Indie Film Hustle about uh, mm-hmm. Quentin Tarantino's first film. Yes, I saw uh, the the my best friend uh, yes. my my birth my best friend's birthday, right. and when I found it, I I'd, I'd heard of it, but I'd never seen it before. So I thought I wanted to kind of bring it to everyone's attention, uh, because when you watch it, you you see the the seeds of genius, right? Kind of like you can see the dialogue, you can hear his hear his voice there. I mean, it's not a good film, so it's very very bad, um, but. You can sense and see that, and it's such a wonderful thing to go back to some a director like Tarantino or any, you know, you know, master of his craft or her craft, and go back to their early, even first work to right. really see what it looked like from mm-hmm. that point to Pulp Fiction. Because <laughs> yeah, I think we all have our own voice. I think you know that, Ever, that's yeah. another mistake young emerging filmmakers yeah. uh, make. That it's like you know they get so caught up in in wanting to be the next Guillermo, be the, the, the next Guillermo, right, right? Exactly. What's my style? That you know that they get bogged down by trying to create style instead of just doing what they would do in any way. You know, had if there was nobody else around, and then that becomes style because style is really an imprint of who you are. And how you see things, not something, a gimmick you come up with, although that can be part of it. You know, I think it's, you know, there's a reason why certain filmmakers will have a certain shot in, the, in the, all their films over and over, but they use it at the right time. Uh, you know, there's a language to it. And, and, and we, we realize it because we've seen it before, but we also, if we had never seen it, it's not something that would jump out at us. It's, it's integral to the storytelling. And that's one thing I always tell filmmakers too that they don't. 
a lot of people always want to be like, I want to be the next Quentin Tarantino. I want to be mm-hmm. the next Guillermo del Toro. I want to be the next Robert Rodriguez. I'm like, you're not going to be. That, yeah. That's not, uh, that's not, an, that shouldn't be your, your goal. Your goal should be the next Eddie Pagan, the next right. Alec Ferrari, you know, that be you. And right. if you notice that all these guys you're talking about, they're all being themselves. None of them right. copied Anyway, other than Tarantino, who copies from everyone, who's now made it an art of copying yeah. everybody, filtering it through his filter. Yeah, but he's a, he's the, he's like one of these ultimate cinephiles who, oh. like, in his work, he's just paying homage to everyone who's blown him away before. Right. But so it's in so, that sense, yeah. he is being him in the sense that Correct. he's the ultimate you know, person that provides homages to other people that he admires. How right. many people in his voice that? though, but in his, in, in his voice, in his voice and his taste and his tone. Um, right. and a lot of filmmakers always get caught up and I've seen so many filmmakers just like trying to be this or trying to be that movie or this is hot now. So I'm going to do this. I'm like, you're not, you're not going to make it. It's not happening. <laughs> it's not happening. So can you give any uh, advice to any budding cinematographers in the audience? Yeah, I think I think the one thing that's being lost these days with all this digital platform, which is, you know, it's it's a it's a blessing and a curse. And and a curse. Because I think what's happening is people are forgetting uh, the true nature of optics. Learn learn your lenses, mm-hmm. learn the language of cinematographer, you know, what what does a wide shot convey? What is a, a shot, you know, shot through a longer lens, a telephoto lens? Uh, convey and the, and you know and study your films. There's there's a way of using these lenses at the right time, and particularly when you're doing coverage. And what what look does it provide to to the to the palette? Because not only are there different types of lenses, and and different types of lenses give you a different uh, aesthetic look, but various focal lengths just do provide a different thing. Some are just a statement. Some are an exclamation point. And one of the things I see a lot happen these days is that, you know, somebody will just rent the zoom lens, mm-hmm. a wide to a moderate telephoto, and instead of using various points of the lens, instead of using primes, but I mean, if you're on a budget and you get a zoom lens, that's okay, mm-hmm. but use the full scale of the lens at the proper time. If you're going to do a close-up or a very, you know, sort of portrait shot, go to the far end of the lens, you know, go a little mm-hmm. bit more telephoto. And instead what I see is they'll, they'll still be on the short end of the lens on, a, right. let's say, a 24. Mm-hmm. Um, and instead of, like, going and zooming in and getting a, a, a shot with a, a particularly amount of depth of field, is that they'll actually just get closer to the, the actor or actress. And so now you have a 24-millimeter lens mm-hmm. a foot from the actress, and they're looking like they're warped. Right. Instead of it being sort of a beauty shot or more something that brings focus just to what's in, in their subconscious, you know, and, and, you know, and, but on the other hand, with the fact that everybody's now using these DC, DSLRs, it's everybody wants to, their shot to be blown out, you know, to have like a shallow depth of field. So every shot has a shallow depth of field. And so, you know, it doesn't work. You have to learn the language, mm-hmm. um, study films. And study your craft. With- yeah. Study your craft. Study your craft. Now, um, how would you approach selling and marketing an indie film, uh, indie horror film, to, in today's world? Like you've seen a lot of filmmakers try to do it. What? How would you approach it, or what advice would you give to an indie filmmaker trying to get noticed? Well, I mean, social media is one way. Obviously, at this point, there's no no way around it. In fact, it's it's kind of flipped on its head now that that's what we're taught should be the thing. I mean, there's film, some film, filmmakers out there that are so young that that's all they've known. I right? know, I know. They don't know. They don't know the old advertising, the old marketing, and magazines and, and magazines <laughs> TV and all that. commercials. So there's different ways of getting the word out there. I think, but we get stuck with this social media thing, which is which is an, an advantage. But you still have to use the old the old world tactics of, of of refining your message and getting that message out there. Social media is just one tool. Whereas marketing and advertising and publicity is 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 a is a craft, just like filmmaking. And I think if you forego the craft of marketing and publicity, and you think that Facebook and Twitter and Instagram is going to do it for you, no, that's mm-hmm. just a message out. But if you don't tweak it and make it interesting and get it before the right people, you're back to square one because everybody's doing it. You know what I mean? There's the, you you don't have don't you don't have the fountain of youth at your disposal. You know, nobody nobody stands out as beautiful if everybody has the pill that makes them, you know, beautiful. Then it's like, what's the extension? You know, and so 
I think the thing that I would say to the emerging filmmakers is partly what you said in your in your uh, podcast about connecting with people and having the tact and tenacity to follow through. Have the tact in the sense that don't bombard people and be obnoxious. You know, find the right way to get yourself introduced, even if it takes three or four times. Because I think if you if if somebody hears your name once and it's in a very casual environment and then they hear it in a newsletter and then they hear it the next time you meet them they say oh yeah yeah i, I remember you we met so but if you're bombarding them you just become that obnoxious person that is just occupying their time and just you know i mean who wants that and then be prepared be really prepared that when you get that moment to shine in front of someone that you're going to be able to answer all their questions, right, better than anyone. They shouldn't be filling in the blanks for you. There's nothing worse than going into a, a session where you're, you're, you know, you're pitching a project at any level. And it doesn't have to be only when you're in the big studios. It could be with anybody. And, and someone with a small production company who's looking to do films can also be your stepping stone, you know, someone that has no as much budget as you do at this point. But the fact that you're going in and you you're the one that should know that project better than anyone. When when I when I've seen I've gone into a room or been in a room when somebody's pitching a project and and they're stumbling and I'm filling in the blanks for them, mm-hmm. that's not good. Mm-hmm. Because you should be the one in that room that knows that project better than anyone. And also the part about passion. I think people te- seem to think that they have to turn it on when they're in front of people, you know, and they think that being that being passionate is being overly bubbly. Mm-mm. That's not passion. You know, passion is when you're homeless and you're still making films. I went through that. Not mm-hmm. a lot of people know that, but I went to a period where I was homeless for about four months sleeping in my office because I had gone through a separation. I was still making my films. Nobody had a clue. And mm-hmm. passion didn't happen in the room when I went in and all of a sudden I started smiling. My passion was that I wasn't going to give up my craft and that I had the tenacity to work on it every day, even though I was I was trying to decide before between a cup of coffee and and, and printing out a page in a script. That's right. passion, you know. That, so I think people need to kind of reorient themselves in these terms that are floating around. And I think one, your podcast is is one of those places because you're giving them the real source. You're giving them the real information that most I people on that. panels aren't telling them. I appreciate that. I, that's that's what I, that's why I started Indie Film Hustle, man. I really wanted to kind of get that out there, and because I see, you know, both of us have been around the game long enough, and we've seen so many filmmakers coming through our doors in one way, shape, or form, that they just get eaten up by the system. Right. And just a little bit of information, little tweaks here and there, can make such a huge difference to a filmmaker uh, trying to make it. And and now, I'm, you know, the goal of Indie Film Hustle is also just to kind of build a career, make a sustainable living doing what you you love to do. Um, right. and it's And it's also something I'm trying to do. You know, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, I'm going to be shooting a film next year. Uh, and in, doing different things to try to sustain myself as as a filmmaker, just doing what I love to do. And, um, I, and I think that's the distinction with the stuff that the way we do it, and I've certainly seen it in your podcast, is that we're not preaching from the platform of the podium. We're like, we're in this also. You know, we're squirrels trying to get our nuts as well. We're, right. You know, we're out there just like you are. We're just giving you information on what's worked for us. Right. And a lot of it is common sense. It's just basically saying, let's not go get caught up in these conventions of social media and how people have become so rude because they just want to cut to the chase that people at the end of the day are still people. And you're still going to rub people the wrong way if you take the wrong approach. So step back, settle in, mm-hmm. get prepared, and then use the right approach at the right time. You know, it's no different than trying to pitch a horror movie to a a, a, a station or network that all does comedies. You know, do your research. It's like it's like back in the days when we used to yeah. do proposals and you sent them out and you did your research and you, you pulled their annual reports and you knew that this particular organization wasn't the right fit. So you move on. Right. You know, so make, make sure that your, your pitches are a mission, mission match. Uh, so that you're not wasting your time or someone else's, right? Yeah, I think it's you'll, you'll never get back at the door, even when you have that comedy, right? And that, I think a, a lot of stuff is a lot of filmmakers today are using the shotgun approach, which right. they just you know spray and scatter, you know, the, you know, right. with an Uzi, just like and eventually they'll hit something, and and that's you know you're just gonna just piss people off, you know, and like you said, even when you do have that comedy script, because you never took the time to build that relationship up. Yeah, no, no, that's that's the worst thing you could do, and 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 you know and and. We have the tools these days at our disposal. Oh my God! If we would have had this back oh, in the eighties, oh my God! Can you imagine? You know, with the with the with the field 
being as limited as it was, but still having these tools. Can you imagine what 80s films would have been like in today's mm. technology? Like, yeah. can you imagine what, like, Jim Cotta would yeah, have looked yeah. like? Yeah. What, what, yeah. The can, what the Cannon Boys would have done? Exactly. So, you know, so it's, it's a blessing and a curse at the same time. It's just a matter of, like, navigating that so you get more of the blessings and less of the curse. Yeah. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to be that cursed uh, filmmaker, you know, there's an old term a friend of mine's uh, Derek Partridge uses all the time. He did, uh, he's done quite a few films uh, together with me. He did a miracle Spanish Harlem and and, mm -hmm. and a lot of others. And um, he says, you know, when you when you get the stank, you know, you get the stank mm -hmm. that just stay. You know, it's your reputation. You get You're the done. stank, and no matter where you go, people can smell it. You know, it's just mm -hmm. like part of you. And if you do it wrong for too too long a, uh, a period, you you end up getting the stank. It's tough. It's yeah. I, I know. I know what you mean. I've I've known filmmakers like that. That they get that stank that they screw people over, or they're not mm -hmm. doing it right, or it, and all of a sudden, like it, it's a small. It's as big of a business as it is. It's extremely small. Exactly. It's extremely small. I mean, and and you have no idea who that one person that you screwed over can has a connection to. I mean, yeah. Look at our relationship. We've known each other for ten years. We know a lot of the same people. Right. Uh, we, 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 we don't run in the same circles, but we do know a lot of the same people. And if I would have screwed you over, you would have screwed me over. God knows how many jobs over the last 10 years that might have affected. That's right. You know, or, or, right. or connections or things like that. And people, uh, especially the younger filmmakers, they don't think long game. They right. only think instant. And if they could just start thinking about the long game a little bit more i think uh more filmmakers would be more successful yeah. so i have uh two more questions for you sir sure uh, they're sure. very di very difficult questions so be careful <laughs> um What's, what did i have for breakfast this morning no, no. where do you see latinhorror.com in five years actually that's not a very hard question because i'm definitely i've been working on a game plan for that well one of the things we're we're developing now is a, a platform called miedo marketing I you love know, one that. Of the things, one of the, one of, yeah, Miedo Marketing. One of which the which can, you trans, can you translate that for the audience? Fear Marketing. Miedo okay. is fear in Spanish. Okay. So we've kind of taken the, the, the Spanish convention as part of the name and the English to finish it off. Miedo Marketing. One of the things I like to do is make sure that people understand phrases that, you know, from our culture mm -hmm. and no different than, you know, saying a schmear on a bagel. Right. Uh, you know, we, we make use of those kind of conventions as well. And Miedo Marketing is a platform. You know, one of the things I get a lot from publicists is, can you promote this film? Can you promote that film? And that's fine when I was developing the thing, but these people are working. These people are sending me these press releases from their office from nine to five you know, and getting paid. So, and I've been doing this long enough and, and, and covering the rent in other ways, but also, you know, getting advertising every once in a while. And then it occurred to me that, you know, why do we have to do this just as a, as a, as a trade-off? It's a hobby. For, <laughs> well, or as a trade-off, because I get a lot of access to screenings and, and, you sure. know, and, and actors and, and, and directors that are mm -hmm. doing these films, you know, kind of almost as a trade-off for publicizing the their films, and I don't publicize the ones that I don't like. Mm -hmm. If you're going to see something in Latin Horror, it's because we, we, we're reviewing it because we like the film to some degree. We may not like all of it. We'll say so. But if a film is really bad, it's just I'm not wasting my time mm -hmm. uh, reviewing a film that's bad. And so we created Me Other Marketing, which is going to be continuing to launch, uh, roll out, which is a platform for us to do marketing for the sector that's trying to reach the Latino and that loves horror films. Um, we have a really substantial database that we've built over time that is not based on spam. These are people that have said, I want more of what you're offering or what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I think what happens to a lot of publicity companies is that at the point that they get a, a job, let's say they're, they're going to do a romantic film, they have to then find the people that are probably geared to to, you know, leaning toward that kind of genre. And so they start looking out for the blogs, et cetera, that, that, that kind of feature that. The same way they trip over Latin horror's website when they're looking to promote uh, uh, horror films. And so I figured, you know, there's time to cut out the middleman and, and generate that income for ourselves instead of uh, doing it for someone at, at, at no cost or as mm -hmm. a, a trade-up. And so that's launching. Um, that's going to be a build. That's almost like a sidearm, a marketing sidearm. It's an entirely for-profit business. Uh, that's Great. going to be sort of, uh, you know, have Latin horror as the as the engine, mm -hmm. uh, powered by as sometimes I see on websites. <laughs> and you know, and and um, and 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 the other thing is that we're going into production ourselves. We've we've produced 
uh, a handful of, of short horror films on the Latin horror label. And, you know, there's a point we're reaching out to different companies to see how we can partner up for them to find content uh, and, and partner with people to produce films. You know, uh, originally low budget features, but, you know, we'll scale it up as we go forward. But the beautiful thing about Latin horror and horror as, as a whole is that it's one of the it's one of the genres that the return on investment is the greatest because a lot mm-hmm. of the horror films are done for relatively small budgets, mm-hmm. and as you see uh, week after week when these films, the really good ones, roll out, is that the return on investment is astronomical in some sense. That's why people keep making them mm-hmm. and hoping that they hit that pot of gold, you know, like, uh, like the paranormal, paranormal activity. activity in sure. those. And actually, you know, even paranormal activity, the the producers that have kind of taken notice of the Latino audience because the last one they made was all Latino characters and it was based on Latino mythology. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, they, they recognize the audience. So that's that's one of the things that's out there. Those two things, you know, Miedo Marketing and also, you know, Latin Horror producing its own content in partnership with other uh, entities. Very cool. Now, the toughest question of the evening. Mm-hmm. Um, what are your top favorite ho- three horror films of all time? Oh, that's that's easy too. Without question, The Exorcist. Mm-hmm. The Thing. Okay. Um, and the one that I saw the first time ever, even though it's kind of a campy British-made film, is uh, Tales of the Crypt, the original one. The original Tales of the Crypt. Not the yeah. one, not from, not, was it Cinemax that released the original? Yeah, they've done a couple of versions sure, of sure, it. Sure, sure, sure. And, and it's a great film, too. You know, it's a really interesting film. But the original, there's something campy about it. And I think just because it was the first horror film that I ever saw in a theater mm-hmm. that spooked me out. Um, it's it's always going to be on the in the pantheon for me. Very cool. Yeah, the thing is like that. that oh, the that. original. Well, and actually, I shouldn't say the original. The second, because it was done one in the fifties, a black and white one. Oh yeah, that's right? the first thing. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Because yeah. everybody, different. you know, even when they made the third one, people were like, "Oh, how could they?" You know, I'm like, well, he did it. Forget <laughs> that the that Carpenter's thing was also a remake. Right, right. But he did such a good job that people oh, forgot about the amazing. original. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's an amazing film. And the funny thing is that they originally they thought it was, you know, they called it pornography and it was horrible mm-hmm. and he was he couldn't even get arrested and Exactly. And and now it's looked upon as like he's a genius, you know. Right. And, and you know, and, and and I was just I actually just saw They Live the other day. Ah, yeah, yeah. What a great flick yeah. that was, you know. I'm currently doing that here now, you know, revisiting all his canon of films as a as an homage, but also as a, as just a, re- a re- orientation to I, myself. Yeah, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen um, Big Trouble in Little China since I was <laughs> uh, since I was a teenager. So I actually it's on my list of it's on my it's on my queue to uh, to watch now because I, I I went through a little John Carpenter now after I saw the interview with him in um. Robert Rodriguez on the director's chair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But listen, listen to us talking about these things. This is like when you know that someone who loves film, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking like little boys. Like, yeah. Oh, back, oh you yeah. Know, because this is, we, we live and breathe this. And, you know, even if the, the industry went away, we'd still be locked up in our homes, cracking open the DVDs until mm-hmm. the point that the DVD player wouldn't work anymore. Or, or, or actually crack opening the Netflix queue. Or the that's Amazon it. Hulu, or that's Amazon, because that's a whole other conversation. That uh, that's right. You know, I've 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 talked to, I've talked to, uh, to some people in regards to the this generation will never understand video stores. Right. They won't understand the the magic that yeah. was at a video store uh, yeah. that you can go Going to down the aisles, finding a new stuff. You know, yeah. things that you would have never seen. Looking at a box, grabbing it, feeling it. That amazing artwork. You know yeah. where where the the artwork promised you something that obviously was not going to happen. Oh, like, obviously. Yeah. Like um, I worked in a video store when I was in high school. So, uh, was it the my favorites were, uh, Slimer uh the Slimerama the girls of Slimerama and the Bolarama, <laughs> which uh yes. sorority excuse sorority babes in the Slimerama Bolarama. Yes. Thank you. Uh, obviously Toxic Avenger, a New York mm-hmm. a, a great indie New York film. Yeah, by Lloyd, and, and that uh, one is tossed around a lot. Is being remade, and it never gets really. Because uh, actually, I'm trying to get Lloyd on the show. I really want to get Lloyd uh, on the show because I've met Lloyd a few times at festivals and stuff, and I think his story is such a unique, yeah, thing about what he's done and how the how the industry has treated him over the years. You know, I mean, he obviously makes his trauma con style movies. It's his. Mm-hmm. It's his stuff, um, and whether you love it or hate it, uh, and it all kind of started with a Toxic Avenger. I remember watching Toxic Avenger, and I'm like, 
what the hell is this? But if you remember, there was a moment in time where there was a Toxic Avenger TV show, like a cartoon show that was like lunchboxes and stuff. And Lloyd said that at one point the studio stepped in and like killed it. Like they weren't going to, they didn't allow him to do it anymore. That's what he says uh, mm. back in the day. Who knows if what's the truth or not. But um, but he's a very interesting story of an, indep- he's as independent as you can get uh, at this point in the game. Uh, and uh, it's fascinating. But yeah, like going through the video stores and seeing that one, uh, those kind but of But also films. that's that that's that great period in, in the genre where like everybody was doing it, you know, even though it was, uh, you know, it was hard to make these films, you know, like you're talking about a lot of them were shot on film and all that. It's like people were still rolling them out. You know, there was like people were being very clever and getting getting mm-hmm. their films made. But the thing is also back then, literally all you had to do was make a film. Yeah. And you would sell it. Because yeah. there was not enough product out there. So exactly. even if it was a horrible piece of crap that you shot on 35 mil and put it out, it, it was going to get sold. You were going to make well, some sort of money with it. I, I got to say, whenever I go to the horror section of Netflix, man, it looks like that's still happening today. Well, yeah, now. Yeah. They need some content. Yeah. Because they're throwing up everything up there. It's, 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 it's bad. It's bad. Yeah. But, it, you know. So anyway, um, where can people find you? Well, they can find me in two places. Um, they can go to latinhorror.com, which is the, the page that's been up like about eight years now. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, they can also find me, uh, you know, as a photographer, as a still photographer that's been shooting for like 40 years. Um, they can go to thepaganimage.com. And that's more just my work as a photographer, uh, both in the South Bronx and since then, kind of social documentary photography and journalist. There's a lot of them. Uh, Articles up there that I've written as well. But how how is that uh, possible if you're only thirty, sir? Uh, I wish I was only thirty. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I was only thirty. With, with the information that I have now, Ooh, I wish I was, I was we 30. could do some. We could do some damage, bro. We could do some damage. <laughs> body blows. Body blows. But um, definitely uh, those two places, you know, and and emails are up there. People really want to reach out and just talk and. You know, I do answer my emails. Uh, you know, it's it's ironic because people, you know, you tell people, yeah, they can reach out and they all say they will. And, you know, the a lot of the people that have become friends over the years with me is people that are really followed too. And like you say, you know, they, they sort of get an interest in you and you get an interest in them. So I'm always willing. I'm always really willing to give information to young emerging you know, filmmakers, you know, to the, to the limits of my ability because you know, I'm not the, I'm not the kingmaker, but, you mm-hmm. know, it, but the, the idea still holds true that if you have a little bit of information and you're willing to share it with people that haven't gone that route yet, you know, you're, you're, you're sort of passing it forward. And I'm always willing to do that. So, if, you know, if anybody wants to reach out on either end, whether it's about photography or cinematography or just the horror genre, particularly the Latin horror genre, or anybody that wants to talk 80s horror, that's fine. Give me, a, you know, give me a buzz. Send me an email. I'm willing to do that. You know, that's that's where I live. That's not, you know, that's not a... Uh, a, a sound bite or a little right. paragraph on the page. That's who I am. So, you know, well, if you I'm start, more, if, I'm more than happy to, to kind of like, you know, chill with you for a minute. Or two. <laughs> Very cool. So everyone definitely uh, check out latinhorror.com. If you guys are horror fans, uh, it's a great site and it's an intelligent site which is rare to find nowadays when you when you're talking about horror. Uh, it's very intelligently written and we're, very well put together and very well curated. Thank, you. thank so, you so much. So thank you so much for coming by and uh, sharing some time with us in the Indie Film Hustle tribe. Uh, I really appreciate it, Eddie. It's my pleasure to come aboard and I'm 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 not saying this lightly when I think I think uh, your podcast is going to go far because it's definitely, you know, you're putting out some some information there that's that most people are not willing to give despite their you know, the secret of at every panel or every book or every article, you know, that's, they're not secrets. They're just more of the same package to sell. Mm -hmm. Your stuff is actually, you know, you're talking about what people are not talking about. And I think, you know, filmmakers in general should take advantage of that. Thank you very much, Eddie. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, man. And like always, there will be sangre, my friend. (laughs) (laughs) I hope you guys had as much fun listening to that as I did uh, having that interview with Eddie. He's, uh, a trip and very knowledgeable about uh, not only Latin horror, but horror in general. Uh, don't forget, hey guys, head over to uh, latinhorror.com if you're into horror films. Um, Eddie's got a great site and it's, uh, like I said, intelligently written horror critiques and um, information about uh, not only uh, good horror films, but the subgenre of Latin horror, which is uh, pretty awesome. So 
Guys, don't forget to head over to uh, filmfestivaltips.com. That's filmfestivaltips.com. So I can share with you my six secrets on getting into film festivals for cheap or free. Help me get into over 500 film festivals all around the world and uh, hopefully can help you guys as well. So, And if you guys are digging the, the show, um, I, and, and apparently by their download numbers, you guys are digging the show. Thank you so, so much for all the all the love that I've been getting for the show. I'm going to keep trying to do as many of these shows as possible, sticking to my two uh, two episodes a week schedule. So if you really, really love the show and want to help us out, please head over to iTunes and uh, leave us a honest uh, review of the show. It helps us out dramatically on the rankings of iTunes. So thanks again, guys, so much for listening and uh, have a scary Halloween, a safe Halloween. And don't forget to keep on hustling. I'll talk to you guys soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 